Hello, hello, lovely to have you here. What I want to discuss in today's video is about organized religion. What do we think of it? Did the Buddha have anything to say about organized religion that might shed some light on his own opinions? We'll get to that. Uh, but first, I, I want to say a, a word about organized religion, uh, because for many of us, it's something of a controversial topic. For some of us, on the one hand, we may be skeptical and concerned about organized religion. We, we may even reject the whole idea of organized religion because we're concerned that, that there are problems that come along with it. Uh, organized religion can be the sort of thing that becomes dogmatic, that that, that uh, bakes certain kinds of dogmas into our approach to religion, to our beliefs, and to our practice. There may also be, we see, a problem with the hierarchies involved in organized religion, that there's a problem of power, indeed even the abuse of power, that some of us, that many of us, find in organized religions around the world. And, and indeed, if we're looking at uh, the news nowadays, we will see some of these problems of abuse in, I would say, every organized religion. For others of us, we may celebrate and love the idea of an organized religion. We may celebrate and, and really feel at home in the, the depth and complexity and even the history of the particular religion to which we feel most at home, in which we feel most at home. And we may also uh, look with some reverence and gratitude to the organization, the organizational structure that preserved the religion and all of its associated beliefs and practices so that we can undertake it nowadays. Uh, one example being the, the Buddhist monastic structure, which is perhaps one of the oldest human institutions in history. It goes back 2,500 years to the time of the Buddha and has, over that period, preserved and protected his, uh, the, the writings, the, the uh, dialogues that, uh, that he produced, or that at least were produced around the time that he lived. And if they had not done this, we would not know, presumably we might not know anything about him nowadays. So there's a lot to, to celebrate within that organizational structure. We may also believe that the whole idea of organized religion is something of a tautology. That is to say, that it's organization itself that makes something into a religion. That without organization, all that we have is, you know, a philosophy, a belief system, a, a life practice, a, a, an ethical practice, something like that. Uh, spirituality. Some people will, uh, will basically uh, uh, con contrast organized religion with something more like spirituality or spiritual training. And again, I'm not going to try to, uh, I should say, I'm not going to try to answer that, that, that question here. It's way too big a question for this video. But let's, let's simply uh, say and observe that to an extent, both of these can, can fall under the tent of Buddhism in general. There are aspects of Buddhism that have uh, both a religious connotation, a, that there is, after all, clearly an organized religion around Buddhism, but it also can be understood in spiritual or philosophical senses that are somewhat opposed to this idea of organization. So in any event, what do we, what do we want to say about the Buddha himself? Evidence from the early suttas indicates that the Buddha worked very hard over many years to try to codify and regulate his, his beliefs, his practices. So that's why we have things like the Four Noble Truths, the Eightfold Path, the gradual training that is explained in so many different suttas. This is one thing that I think distinguishes, let's say, Buddhism from Stoicism or Epicureanism. Similar kinds of philosophical, uh, spiritual, or ethical practices that we find in the Western tradition. They didn't have the same kind of codification that we find in Buddhism. Also, we find different kinds of hierarchy. There is what we might term a hierarchy of commitment. So you have lay people, you have novice monastics, you have fully ordained monastics, and you have enlightened arahants. And these are, again, a level, levels of commitment to the practice that go up over time or over, you know, depending on how deep we want to get into things. We also have 
a hierarchy of attainments. So we have stream enterers, we have once returners, we have non returners, and we have again arahants. This is a, a hierarchy of attainments. Within uh, the Buddhist monastic structure itself, we have a hierarchy of, of uh, people who have uh, become a fully ordained monastic at one time versus another time. So the elder monastics are higher up in this hierarchy than the, the, the monastics who have just recently been ordained. So there are all kinds of these hierarchies that persist within Buddhism that seem to at least, again, depending on how we interpret the the, the, the literature seemed to actually originate within the early tradition itself, within the Buddha's lifetime. And of course, this was all elaborated in much more detail after the Buddha's death. And there was indeed even a sort of a, a further understanding where we have arahants or fully enlightened beings, but also we have Buddhas that are even greater than arahants. That idea that Buddhas are a separate kind of being that we can attain to was something that really arose, seem, seems to have arisen in the years, decades, and centuries after the Buddha's death. So in any event, but in any event, I do want to say that some of this is controversial from an academic perspective. Some academics believe that many of these hierarchies were not original to the Buddha, but rather they, they, they arose during these later centuries while the monastics tried to come up with their own senses of hierarchy. But that doesn't need to uh, detain us here. What is nevertheless clear is that the Buddha did try, seems to have tried hard to organize his belief system, or if we might say his religion, depending on how we understand it. But the question for us now is, did the Buddha see any downsides to this organization? Did he see any downsides to what we might term organized religion? Now, of course, it's impossible to say for sure, because the whole idea of religion is a Western and somewhat contemporary, or at least re more recent concept, it's not something that the Buddha would have had in mind. However, there are some interesting indications in the early suttas that I think deserve some study or some understanding on our part. For example, part of what makes something an organized religion is that there are rules, that there are lots of rules that one has to follow, in particular, if we're going to be a monastic, if we're going to be somebody actually uh, in the religion uh, in, the, in its uh, most uh, important sense of, of, of being a real sort of professional there, then we have rules to follow. However, what we find when we look at the early texts is that the, the Buddhist rules uh, book, the, the, the rules of the, what's called the Vinaya, which is the, the rule book that establishes what monastics can and can't do, that developed over a period of time, indeed over a period of many years. One example of this I discussed in a recent video, I'll leave a link to that video down below if you haven't seen it, in the, I'll leave it in the notes. Uh, one example has to do with food and eating, where it seems that originally uh, monastics could eat whenever they wanted to, they could eat however many meals they wanted to in a day, it didn't really matter. However, over time, the Buddha laid down rules that monastics were supposed to only eat one meal a day, and they were supposed to eat that meal in the morning, that is to say, before noon, or at least before midday. And there are myriad other examples. Indeed, the Vinaya itself, this rule book I've just mentioned, is a, largely a compilation of the stories that developed around each of these rules, showing how the rule developed. Now, a story that shows how that rule developed over time indicates for each of these rules that there was a time before that rule existed, when the Buddha didn't see a need for it. And so it shows, again, that these rules were not initially part of what Buddhism was. Now, one uh, very clear example of this has to do with ordination, that is to say, becoming a monastic. It seems in the early Sangha, in order to become a monastic, all that had to happen was the Buddha would sort of point to you and say, come monk. And if he did that, then you were at that point, ipso facto, a monastic. You were ordained within the Buddha's Sangha. However, over time, 
we must assume, that became somewhat unwieldy, and so there were instituted a number of rules, indeed somewhat complex rules, about what had to be done. In particular, there, had to be, there, there, there came to be instituted a, a dual structure kind of thing where you were uh, first a, a novice monastic for a period of time, and then you were fully ordained, and that you know, helped to weed out people perhaps who were not really prepared for monastic life. So it gave them a period of time to sort of try things out before they sort of jumped fully into monasticism, a number of other things as well. But the point here is pretty clear. And on one occasion, the Buddha was asked by a monk just about the, the establishment and development and arising of all of these rules. Now the monk asked, what is the cause, sir? What is the reason why there used to be fewer training rules, but more enlightened mendicants? And what is the cause, what is the reason why these days there are more training rules and fewer enlightened mendicants? Now note here, critically, that this monk is, is claiming that there is, appears to be a correlation between the number of rules instituted by the Buddha and the number of enlightened people that seem to arise out of the monastic community. What he's saying is the more rules, the less enlightened people. And, you know, many of us nowadays, or many people nowadays, will bemoan the fact that it appears there are so few, if any, enlightened people around, whereas it seems if we look at the suttas, there are enlightened people pretty much everywhere. There are suttas that claim that, you know, dozens or hundreds of people become enlightened by hearing a particular talk of the Buddhas. And we may take that as somewhat overblown hagiography at times, but nevertheless, uh, there seems to be something to this that there appear, at least if we take these suttas at face value, that enlightenment seems to have been easier back then than it is now. My point is that it seems even to be the case during the Buddha's own lifetime that it, was, it seems to have been easier early on than it was later, and this monk is, is remarking on this. So here's what the Buddha had to say. The teacher, that is the Buddha, doesn't lay down training rules for disciples as long as certain defiling influences have not appeared in the Sangha. But when such defiling influences appear in the Sangha, the teacher lays down training rules for disciples to protect against them. Now this, of course, seems reasonable enough. The Buddha is not going to lay down rules until these uh, defiling influences appear. But that, that, of course, begs the question, why do these defiling influences appear in the first place? And fortunately, the Buddha goes on to explain why he thinks they do. He says, and they don't appear until the Sangha has attained a great size, an abundance of material support and fame, learning and seniority. And this list of attributes parallels pretty closely with what we've been discussing when it comes to organized religion. So the Buddha talks about size. Uh, a religion has to be of a certain size to be considered an organized religion. It has to have material support in the, in the, in the form of wealth. Uh, that is to say, it has to be sizable enough and famous enough, and that's the next uh, topic here, fame. It has to be famous enough among enough lay people to attract wealth and become wealthy. It has to have learning, which we might understand as codification and organization in the, within the Sangha. So it's not simply a matter of a bunch of different people with different ideas, but rather a codified and organized uh, set of, of beliefs, of, of dharma, that is, uh, that is exchanged from one person to another. And finally, this notion of seniority that the Buddha mentions, or an implicit sense of hierarchy within the structure of certain people who have a greater sense of power and other people who have perhaps a less sense of power, which gives the organization its structure and allows decisions to be made uh, with more uh, alacrity, shall we say, with more uh, capability. So organized religion, we can see, begins with fame. The fame is initially a good thing. It attracts attention. It attracts wealth. Uh, 
which allows the organization, the, the religion, the, the belief system to be distributed more widely, more people are involved, it gets bigger, and then it becomes more unwieldy. These defiling influences that the Buddha mentioned arise within the organization. Perhaps it attracts people who are less savory, uh, perhaps it attracts people who are at least in earlier stages in the path and so may do things that are wrong. And in order to deal with that, there have to be rules. In order to implement these rules, there has to be a hierarchy of people who are both aware of the rules and able to enforce the rules. Um, and so we end up with something more like a, an organized religion, but we have to understand this is an organization that arises out of the, the defiling influences. It arises out of these defilements because it has to, because the organization must exist in order to treat these defilements. And the Buddha seems to have recognized these as necessary evils that have to be dealt with in order that the, the Dharma be able to be propagated and continue. However, for, for many of us, we may find uh, more solace or more of a home within the earlier Buddhist community in which this organization, these rules were not so important. That is the, the, the kind of community that would have existed when there were not so many monastics, when there were not so many defiling influences around, and when it was basically the Buddha and a small group. That may attract many of us more as, as being an example of a kind of a philosophical or spiritual or ethical practice that is not involved with this kind of larger organization. Whereas for others of us, we may take solace in the organization itself, in its worldliness, in its uh, power and effectiveness, in its great history. And this will very much depend on our background and interests. We don't, it's not the case that all of us need to make the same decision here. In any event, does the Buddha's experience here, does what the Buddha says change or alter or influence your view of organized religion? What do you think? Do you think that what he has to say makes a difference? Uh, to me, I find it very interesting. Now, I did an earlier video on whether or not Buddhism was a religion. Now, in this video, my argument was that it wasn't necessarily a religion. It could be seen as something that was simply a philosophy or a life practice. However, it can be seen both ways. Now, anyway, I'll leave, this is a very early video of mine, so you have to take that into consideration, but I'll leave a link to it up here on the screen if you're, if you're not familiar with it. Again, it's from quite a while ago. Uh, if you're getting something out of these videos of mine, uh, consider taking a look at my Patreon page, which is linked down below in the notes, and see if you want to help support the channel and the work that we're all doing here. Thanks so much to all of you, and we'll catch you on the next video. And meanwhile, all of you, be well.